Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, make us worthy to celebrate the spiritual hymns, your appearance to Thomas and to your apostles. You desire to strengthen the faith of your holy church by inviting Thomas to place his hand in your pure side. Strengthen our faith like his in the mystery of your glorious resurrection. Fill us with your hope and your love so that we may raise glory to you, to your Father and to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with the church and her children. Praise, glory, honor, and praise to God the Father who sent his only begotten Son for the salvation of the world, and to the Son who filled the universe with a new light by his glorious resurrection, and to the Holy and to the Holy Spirit who embraced the hearts of the apostles with joy and with peace. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. O Christ our God, by your glorious resurrection, you gave joy to those in heaven and on earth, uniting them spiritually as one. Eight days later, you visited your holy apostles and entered the upper room where they had gathered and with the door shut. You invited Thomas to see and to place his hand in your side, pierced by the lance, and to touch your hands wounded by the nails. He proclaimed his faith, crying out, My Lord and my God. And you made him a witness to your glorious resurrection. Therefore we who have been saved by your victorious cross implore your grace and ask you with the fragrance of this incense to grant us the blessing that you promise to those who have not seen you and yet believe. Make us worthy to celebrate this new Sunday with joy and gladness and prepare us and our departed for that joyful and eternal feast so that we may raise glory and thanks to you to your Father and to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever.
O Christ our God, accept our incense as we commemorate your appearance to your Apostle St. Thomas. As you were pleased by his faith and the profession of your divinity, accept our prayers and our petitions, and favorably remember all the faithful departed who have died hoping in you, and grant them eternal rest. We raise glory and thanks to you, now and forever. Amen. Second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, therefore, since we know the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others but we are clearly apparent to God, and I hope we are also apparent to your consciousness. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to boast of us so that you may have something to say to those who boast of external appearance rather than of the heart. For if we are out of our minds, it is for God. If we are rational, it is for you. For the love of Christ impels us once we have come to the conviction that one died for all. Therefore, all have died. He indeed died for all so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. 
Consequently, from now on we regard no one according to the flesh, even if we once knew Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him so no longer. So whoever is in Christ is in a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And all this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting us in, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting us to the message of reconciliation. So, we are the ambassadors for Christ, as if God were appealing through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who did not know sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Praise be to God always. Alleluia. Alleluia. You have believed because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen yet come to Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Shlomo elokolechuna From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Saint John who proclaimed life unto the world Let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls The Apostle John writes, And now a week later, after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came, and although the doors were locked, and he stood in their midst, and he said to them, Peace be to you. Then he said to Thomas, Place your finger here, and see my hands and bring your hand and place it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believe. And Thomas answered and he said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, You have come to believe because you have seen me. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in his name. 
This is the truth, peace be with you. Peace be with you. That was a quotation. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. As Catholics, we do the same thing. If the priest ever says in a sermon, in the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, all the hands start moving. They're beautiful habits. So peace be with you, this greeting that St. John wants us to see very clearly. Remember that whenever there are things unique in the Gospel of St. John that stand out, stories, episodes that he brings up, it's because there's a very specific lesson that he wants us to understand from that. He's writing decades after the first three Gospels, and so in a sense, from his perspective, he's filling in holes. He's filling in the lacuna, the, the holes that are in certain places in the stories. And so he wants these instructions, and this story of St. Thomas is one of them. It's not recounted in the other. And also the detail about being after eight days. This is the eighth day of the resurrection. This is a transition. And so important is the story of St. Thomas. We have in English, we talk about doubting Thomas. This aspect of, of St. Thomas's profession of faith is a transition because it's moving from one form of knowledge to another form of knowledge, from an old order of things to the eighth day. So I've given you the large write-up, as I try to do each year, on what is the Sunday? Why is the Sunday central? The Sunday is the gathering in. The Sunday is the way in which we find contact on the day of the resurrection with, our, with the risen Lord in order that we be transformed because we do not see but we are among those that our Lord says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So Thomas is a transition. Thomas is, uh, we're, it's recounted, it's yesterday's gospel, the section just before this, of how when our Lord first appears on the first day of the week, on the day of his resurrection, this his appearance to them in the evening. And the details are the same. The doors are closed, the doors are locked, and the presence of our Lord amongst them. And so the same thing happens on the eighth day, the following week, the following Sunday. This transition is the reason why in our Syriac tradition, we call this the new Sunday. It indicates the sacramental transformation of the day temporarily, of what Sunday actually means. It represents the eternal. It represents the vision of God. It represents God himself, the eighth day, because there are seven days in creation. Sunday is the first day of the week. It follows the seventh day. So the fathers of the church reflecting this gospel speak of it as being the eighth day, which is the sacramental indication, if you like, of the eighth day that St. Paul talks about in his letter to the Hebrews being what we call heaven, the eighth day, the Ogdoad in Greek. And so this is a transition, and Thomas is the pivotal person. He is the person upon which St. John has the occasion in his gospel to explain this transition from a world which was very concrete, a very observable. Remember, the law of Moses is a series of observances, things that we do, forms of sacrifices, ways to pray, ways to do things, to go up three times a year for the great festivals to the temple. What to eat, what not to eat, how to cook, how not to cook, how to mix things. It's all very much on the level of what St. Paul calls the flesh. Flesh is nature. It doesn't mean that it's bad. But when we say that someone lives in a carnal way, in St. Paul's understanding is that you're just living by a purely naturalistic vision, just using our natural wits which of course is never going to be great anyway because it's wounded by original sin. But even in its best understanding, just using our natural wits will always be insufficient. This is what's represented by St. Thomas saying, unless I see his hands, 
and not just see him, but be able to put my finger into the holes of the crucifixion, I won't believe. And unless I can put my hand into his side, where the lance opened his side after his death, I won't believe. Now, we have the, the basic fundamental story that is told in this transitional period, is our Lord rebukes the apostles in the Gospel of St. Mark because the women that have come in the morning, St. Mary Magdalene who have come, has come in the morning, when these individuals come and they say, we have seen angels or the tomb is empty, the apostles don't believe them. They don't give credence to what they're saying. And our Lord rebukes them in the Gospel of St. Mark because you know these people, you know these women, you should have believed what they said. They had credibility. And so our Lord rebukes them. So St. Thomas now is going to become that story even more because we're not told about Thomas in the other Gospels. If this one tells us clearly, St. John, is that Thomas is not there on that first day. So when they're all rebuked in the Gospel of St. Mark, Thomas is actually not there. So Thomas becomes another occasion because Thomas, we're given the very fleshed out story in detail, is Thomas does exactly the same thing that his colleagues did to the other women. He doesn't believe them. And that's why he says, unless I see, unless my finger goes in those wounds, unless my hand goes in that side, I'm not going to believe. So Thomas is actually rejecting the testimony that he's heard about what the women have said and seen and of the, the witnesses of the two men of Emmaus. And he's re rejected the other 10 apostles who have said, we've seen him, we've touched him. And he rejects that also. Now in the first week, bright week, or white week, we can call it bright week, the week that we've just coming now to a conclusion by the eighth day, all of the Gospels are an emphasis upon the historical appearances of our Lord to the disciples. The rest of this season now following after the eighth day, following New Sunday, the emphasis is going to be the transition of the way that God reveals himself to us in the spirit, not historical conditions, because we don't live in that historical period. And yet the resurrection still manifests itself to us internally through that light of the faith, that ability to believe. And it is a gift, the ability to believe. And we know that because you can hear the same words, you can hear the same story, and it will have a great amount of meaning to you. But you read the same words to a pagan, and they're like, okay, so there was a guy who didn't believe, someone comes, Jesus is there, and that's it, now he believes. All right, what's the big deal? What's the story? But the story is not just that event. Our Lord is bringing that transition of transforming the Sunday, the first day, the eighth day, the day of the resurrection is being transformed because it's within that context that the Lord actually reveals himself to us. This is why the church is always considered to assist at Mass on Sundays to be a serious obligation. Because when we ignore it, it's not because of the law, but because when we ignore it, ignore it, we are in a very serious way ignoring this revelation that Christ is trying to give us. And on that level, the scriptures, which are magnificent and beautiful to read, and the church has always encouraged the people to read them for private prayer, but the scriptures are actually never understood except that insofar as they are proclaimed within the liturgical context of the church's life. So you can read this story at home, but when the gospel is proclaimed within the liturgical action, within the sacrifice of the Eucharist, now that revelation that is made to Thomas becomes much clearer because it is here upon this altar that the Christ is himself substantially present, offering himself, being offered, and being received. All of a sudden, this transitions to the story of just reading a story or hearing a story about some guy 2,000 years ago who happened to be incredulous and doubting. So there's a transition that's taking here in the story of St. Thomas where our Lord is shaking him out of these old law observances to do this, not to do that, to do these things in this way. And his concreteness and his rejecting of actually the testimony of others who have seen our Lord, all of that our Lord has to correct 
And that's why what you notice at our Lord's greeting, peace be to you. Peace be to you is the idea, the Shlomo el Kulchun. That's why last fall when we transitioned to use that greeting, Shlomo el Kulchun, wa'am diloch. You know, may peace be to you, and may it be also to your spirit individually, your spirit, the priest. This wishing of integrity, of tranquility, of transformation of the individual, the shalom, the shlomo, this transition and this healing is precisely what salvation is. Our Lord says this to the apostles on the first day of the resurrection. And he repeats exactly the same thing to Thomas. But now to Thomas, it's not just simply the normal greeting, but this is the healing that Thomas actually needs. So you'll notice in our Masmuro, in the prayer, the hymn that's before the readings, you'll notice that in the second verse, he says, I have sinned. I have failed here. Not because of his unbelief, but his first failing is he rejects the testimony that has been given by the others who have seen our Lord. Because remember, St. Thomas has heard more stories than just the original ones. I mean, we could, to some extent, on a human level, ex understand a bit more Peter and John and the other apostles when the women come running in half terrified out of their mind and also half jubilant and just this kind of strange emotion when they come running in and saying, we've seen angels and the tomb's empty. We can understand that because of the basis that's there. But when you have the apostles or Mary Magdalene who says that I have seen him, I have spoken to him. That's a much greater sense of testimony and witness. It's not just, we don't know what's going on and the tomb is empty. Oh, and by the way, we saw angels. That aspect of the emptiness. But to say that we have actually seen the Lord and spoken to him, Thomas is rejecting all of those levels of witness. And so the Shlomo al Kulkun in this context, peace be to you, this peace is being granted to all of them, but it's for Thomas's healing that necessarily has to be done. And then you'll notice that what our Lord does is he doesn't say anything else, he just immediately looks at Thomas. And he repeats what Thomas has said eight days before. So come and put your finger in my hands. It's like he's continuing the conversation from the incredulity of Thomas the week before and just repeats pretty much word for word. Okay, fine, here. Put your finger in. And here, if you have to do this too, then come and put your hand in my side. It's a very profound thing because our Lord is picking up Thomas, taking him up exactly where his unbelief and his brokenness is. And the Lord God does this to us in our lives. He picks us up where we are at in our sinfulness, in our brokenness, in our woundedness. And many times he repeats exactly the things that we are having troubles with which is why we then call it a cross, because our Lord actually sends us things that are exactly the most annoying things in our lives. He knows exactly where to place all the splinters in the cross, as we say. And he's doing exactly the Thomas. Thomas's reaction is part of also his humiliation. And this is what the love of God does. He will bring us down. He will smack our faces in the ground because he loves us. This is the other aspect. Thomas is being humiliated in front of the other apostles. He's the one who said with great certainty, great surety, unless I put my finger into those holes, unless I put my hand into that side, I'm not going to believe you guys. And so now our Lord repeats word for word in front of the other ten apostles, whose witness he's rejected a week before. Now he repeats it. So he's also humiliated in the midst of this. And his reaction, we're not told anything else, we can probably presume that he does not touch our Lord, but we just have this reaction of faith, my Lord and my God. And so he may have touched our Lord, we don't know, the gospel doesn't tell us. What it tells us is that Thomas is transformed in this action, in this shlomo, on this eighth day of a transition from incredulity to belief. So that when our Lord says to Thomas, so this is what you needed, this is what you required, this is what you insisted on, so that you believe. But blessed are those who actually have not seen and yet believe. 
This doesn't mean believe in anything. This believes in the testimony of that unbroken witness from person to person, generation to generation, from the morning of the resurrection to this day. So that when those individuals move away from the divine Eucharist, where the risen Lord reveals himself in his death and resurrection in the sacrament of the divine Eucharist, they move farther and farther away from that witness, they move farther and farther away from the witness of the, of the risen Lord, and they move farther and farther away then of the very source of life which gives them shlomo, which gives them peace. That's why so often we see in our anaphoras, we pray for those who are far. Far doesn't mean, you know, they're 100 miles away. Far means they could be living two blocks away and just be totally distant from the divine altar. That's being far. That is what Thomas is on the day of the resurrection when he says to the other apostles, I'm not going to believe this. He is far. And our Lord, in order to snap him back and to bring him back, into believing requires all those aspects of the context of reflecting his words, of being humbled, of being humiliated to some degree. Because the Lord God is chasing us down to bring with his charity. But he will never force us to believe. There are many of the disciples, certainly, who were following our Lord along, or around when he, they saw miracles being performed in healings, who do not believe after our Lord's resurrection. As there are to this day many baptized individuals who do not believe. They may be historically through their baptism Christians, but their faith is gone. You can hardly call that a believer or a disciple. A disciple is desirous to learn. And so once that faith and once we are far, that is a loss. And God allows that freedom. He has made us free creatures. He guides us by our freedom. And that is the story of Thomas. That is what St. Thomas is actually there for. In order to be able to say that that faith that relies upon the witness of the church, not of a book, but of living people who have echoed this word that we have seen the Lord, this is why it's echoed. And if you look at the Mazamoro again, you have not only that St. Thomas says, I have sinned, but you'll notice in the first two verses, the last line is, and I will go and I will preach the word. I have now sinned, I realize my sin, but I also believe. And in believing, I will go and I will bring witness. The witness that I rejected Eight days ago, that witness, I will now preach. I will now announce. And so Thomas shows in his conversion, and Thomas is also pivotal for us as Maronites, because St. Thomas, one of the places that he evangelizes is in Mesopotamia. He is the apostle of the people of the Middle East. And so St. Thomas stands out in that. He continues on beyond the Middle East into India, and his tomb is in India. But he begins in the Middle East. He is part of that vision and part of that announcement. So the Masmuro is echoing verse after verse. I did not believe. Now I see. And in seeing, I choose. And I will go. And I will preach this witness to others. And in the end of his life, he pays for it in martyrdom. By being killed, by being murdered, by being martyred by the pagan priests, the Brahmin in India. That's the meaning of New Sunday. A transition from a historical reality be revealing itself to the transition of that revelation of resurrection in the spirit given to us in faith through the testimony of the church. So may doubting Thomas, who doubts now no longer, intercede for us and obtain for us that profound conviction of recognizing that even if we sin, that that witness of the resurrection has to be the power that drives our lives. And so may his prayers be a rampart to us always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him. upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Saba. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
seria a versão? Aleluia! with a holy kiss, that through Jesus Christ our Lord we may be your radiant and blameless flock. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give our, the greeting of peace to our neighbor in love and faith, which is pleasing to God. that you grant us in your mercy the riches of your grace and kindness. May your compassion and assistance sustain us all the days of our lives. Through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, we glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. sent your only Son to save us, for we are weak and poor. When we had gone astray, he brought us back to your spiritual fold by his royal blood. Through your grace and the favor of your only Son, we implore you to accept this bloodless sacrifice from our sinful hands, and through it to forgive our sins. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. our minds and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to 
the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just. Truly glory, thanks, praise, and honor are yours, O God the Father, maker of all creation. With your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit, the angels, archangels, and all the heavenly hosts bless and praise you. They cry out and they proclaim. your saving passion and life-giving death, your burial, your glorious resurrection and ascension into heaven, your sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and your royal second coming when you will judge all people and reward them according to their deeds. Now we ask you, at that fearful hour, have compassion upon us and have mercy on us in your kindness and forgive our sins in your mercy. For this your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father. Have mercy on us. Your sinful children receive your graces. We thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you, and we ask you have compassion on us, O God, have mercy on us and hear us. 
How awesome is this moment, O my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Manin Maria, Annin Maria, Manin Maria, Nite Maro Rochu Chayu Kodisho, Onachen the line of our Corbono, O no. May these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the burden of faults, the honor, upbuilding, and strengthening of your holy church, and the protection of her children from all sin. And may these holy mysteries allow us to stand with confidence before your awesome throne, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, exalt your holy church established throughout the world. Protect her shepherds of the true faith in peace and security all the days of their lives, especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashar Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops, pious priests, pure deacons, and all who serve your holy altar. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who call upon your holy name. Bless those who are near, and bring back those who are far. Visit the sick and strengthen the weak. Release captives and assist the oppressed. Bring back those who have strayed that they may live in your fear and reward those who have brought offerings to your holy church. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders and all the children of your holy church. Grant them security and peace and keep domestic and foreign conflicts far from them, so that they may live in tranquility. Protect them by the sign of your living and victorious cross. Rescue the persecuted and the displaced of your flock, and be a refuge for strangers and a companion to travelers. Grant your eternal reward to monks and to those who live solitary lives, and to hermits who live on mountaintops and in the caves of the earth. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, upon this altar and upon your heavenly altar, the holy and ever Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, and evangelists, John the Baptist, the forerunner, Stephen the archdeacon and first martyr, Saint Joseph, Saint Jude, Saint Saba, and all the saints. May we join their ranks and share in their joyful feast. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the faithful teachers who have gone to their rest in the true faith, especially Peter and Paul, Mark, Clement, Ignatius, Dionysius, Julius, and all those who endured suffering and persecution for the strengthening of your holy church. Remember also those who serve your holy altar and forgive their sins, that they may reach your joyful dwellings. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who have left this world and have gone to you. Lead them to your joyful dwellings and blot out all their sins. To our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, 
We hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant us, O God, to be departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. Sanctify us now, that we may be renewed as your spiritual children, so that with pure hearts and enlightened souls, we may call upon you, O glorious Father and lover of all people, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation of soul and body, and crush our enemy, the evil one. Grant us your mercy through Christ Jesus our Lord, for you are blessed and glorified with him and with your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo elokolechun. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, look upon us, your inheritance, who bow before you, and guide our steps on your right path. Make us worthy to share in this sacrifice, and may it sanctify the souls and bodies of those who receive it. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, we glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One, one Holy Father, one, one Holy Son, one, one Holy Spirit. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth. To Him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by Your holy body, and our souls purified by Your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord, our God, to You be glory.
Again and again, we thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, O compassionate and merciful one, O lover of all people, have mercy on us. God the Father, how can we, who are unworthy, thank you for your grace. For you have given us this divine gift and have made us worthy to share in the body and blood of your only begotten Son who saved us. Through him and with him, glory and honor are due to you and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo el Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, you are worshipped and you are holy. Bless and forgive the priests who are the stewards of your people and of your holy church. Forgive the servers of your divine mysteries and all the faithful who have assisted in this sacrifice. Care for orphans, help widows, assist the poor and the distressed. Satisfy the hungry and protect all who call upon your holy name in every place. 
May your name be glorified with that of your Father and your Holy Spirit, who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you now and forever. Amen. So, first of all, thank you for the many gifts that came in last week for the pastor for Easter. You were very generous. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you. And also to note that during this week, I'll be at the monastery. So there will be no public masses Tuesday through Friday. So the next mass will be Saturday morning. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Amen.